All right. Welcome, everyone, to uh, the first SID lecture of uh, this academic year. And today we have the opening of the academic year itself. And today we'll have also have the opening of the SID academic year. Um, so, I'm glad we will make it today, despite the current situation, health crisis, all that. And we are some of the lucky few. We've had to turn down many because there's just too much interest and too little space. Um, so, I hope you all enjoy it today. And uh, yeah, welcome to SID. So, I'm Matthias from the Tartan, and I am the Commissioner of Intellectual Activities of SID, and I will be uh, organizing and hosting all of the events in the upcoming semester, the upcoming year. Uh, together currently with the introduction committee to go down the left by Martin Andreas in that in front. So you'll be uh, seeing all of them in the upcoming uh, lectures if you stick around. But um, today we're joined by Mr. Jalan Kashaw from the Klingon Institute. He's a research fellow and focusing on, as you can see, Libya. Um, very prestigious background, very prestigious history. But um, I feel like I should really just leave the words to Mr. Uh, Rashaw uh, to introduce the topic and uh, continue on into the lecture. So thank you, Mr. Rashaw. Please a round of applause. Thank you, Matthias, for the invitation. Thank you for the entire team. I'm uh, very happy to be in my uh, first physical event in six months. Uh, the true reason I came here is because Canada hired an intern. Yeah. 
uh, I'd like to go much further in the past. Uh, the nation, uh, from, from a geographic perspective, the, the first characteristic is that it, it has a very small population. Uh, right now, there's probably just 6.5 million natives that, that live uh, on the physical uh, living soil. And uh, speaking of the soil, it's obviously very rich. It has uh, the largest uh, crude oil reserves in Africa. The actual crude is a particular uh, high quality, which means that it requires a, a very small amount of refining uh, that makes it particularly interesting for, for southern Europe. Um, it has other natural resources that are largely untapped. Iron ore, gold, diamond. Um, they have also a lot of water in the ground. And, uh, and also think about the solar energy potential uh, within the next few years where everybody will have industrialized that kind of energy. So, and, and you have to add to that the location. Uh, you know, imagine that you start building uh, a, a large amount of ports and you manage them in a, in a very Chinese or Emirati way. By, by, what I mean by that is more efficient. Uh, you could start appreciating the uh, potential. On top of it, you can also add the touristic, uh, tourism potential. Uh, so it's a very, uh, very attractive territory with a lot of potential, for almost no, no downside. Uh, and I would like to, kind of, I would like you to keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing that I would like to to add as some kind of a historic uh, reality attached to that territory is that from a Western perspective. Uh, you can see that it's that this territory, geographically speaking, or geostrategically speaking, is, is obviously very important. We don't, we don't need more than a couple minutes to figure that out. But in terms of Western perception, there's one, one tradition that has always failed to exist from a Western perspective, whether like it's American or Italian or French. Libya was never really acknowledged as very important. And that has more to do with psychology than, than objective uh, criteria. Uh, so it's important, but it was never recognized as such from a Western perspective. And now, you know, you can think about the people who are really active in Libya, those are the Russians, the Turks, and uh, the Gulf states, those are not you know, Western nations. And for them, I mean, from, from a historical perspective, they have a greater ability to really appreciate the, the full points of the territory better than the Europeans or attached to their history and, and all the distortions uh, associated with it. Um, concretely, uh, of course, the, the most important date uh, in recent memory is 2011. And the reason uh, 2011 is important is because uh, the regime that was in place for 42 years up to that point uh, was basically uh, a lot of time. Um, through uh, violent uprisings, militarized uprisings. So it's not a Tunisian scenario, and it's not an Egyptian scenario. It's a very unique, uh, very militarized uh, scenario, and of course, on top of it, you have to have the uh, external intervention by NATO, but it's not just NATO, it's also Arab states. I'll, I'll, I'll go through this uh, more in detail. So, what is this object that, that basically collapsed? in August, uh, October 2011. It's obviously a tyrannical uh, regime, uh, that of the commander of Gaddafi, who uh, basically rose to power in September 1969, and he consolidated his power uh, system in 1973 and 70s. Um, and uh, from the foreign policy perspective, he was always extremely aggressive, always going to the outside, that was one way he thought he protect the survival of his own, of his own system. And, um, and so if, if you hear about, the, for example, the, the terrorism that was going in the 70s and the morning of the games, all of it is true. I mean, a lot of it is, is really uh, nasty. And in 1988, one particular time that he was not, I, I don't think he are frustrated, it's uh, the lack of meat. Basically, exploded all over Scotland. He was accused. Uh, I think that he, Iran played a role in that. 
So, but the bottom line is that uh, international sanctions were instituted in 1992 that caused his uh, country, Libya, to become completely closed off. Uh, and uh, one form of, but everybody knows about the foreign intervention of 2011, there was another foreign intervention, much softer, that I'd like to draw attention to, that happened uh, exactly in December 2003, uh, several months after the uh, uh, US UK attack on, on Iraq. And, and what happened in Libya was basically a peace deal. It was an agreement to dismantle the um, uh, weapons of mass destruction program that the uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of chemical weapons and some nuclear programs that he was supposed to have. But what, what I'm interested in is the fact that foreign states actually started interfering or exerting some kind of influence over how that society was being run, uh, including the European Parliament and politics, starting in 2004. So that period, 2004 to 2011, was basically the period of, of a much more brutal form of international politics. So this whole negotiation period started in 97. What I find interesting about it, what's interesting about this moment is because this is it's just the nature of the states that kind of pushed the UK and the US into um, revising this idea of maintaining their international sanctions. And which were the, which states were, uh, were those actors? It was the Vatican, Nelson Mandela, who was at the height of his, his glory. Uh, who immediately encouraged Saudi Arabia, that was hated by Gaddafi, to help Gaddafi. So that was a prestige, this liberal uh, euphoria of the 90s. And, uh, and those are the states that basically were able to uh, make sure that the US and the UK were going to finally sit down at the table and, and try to find an arrangement. And that is the arrangement that was basically concluded in December 2003. The bottom line is that we enter a period in 2004, uh, roughly seven years, where um, the, the, a lot of things happen. Number one, the oil prices started going higher and higher. That was just a coincidence. The international sanctions were removed just at the beginning of this uh, bullish cycle uh, that began in 2000, 2002. Um, this means that effectively a country that was used to really not spending a lot of money, a small population that was talking about earlier, uh, you know, very austere, and every, you can call it a form of efficiency, um, started making tons of, of money in the form of savings. So you have almost a decade where Libya saved tens, you know, billions of dollars. It ended basically that decade with, a, with uh, uh, you know, something like 65 billion in the sovereign wealth fund, plus 110 billion in its central bank, just in the form of um, and, and, you know, in, in, in dictatorships, when you start having this kind of wealth, usually it triggers revolution. That's what happened with Iran uh, during the, uh, the high prices of the 70s. That's how basically you ended up with the uh, theocratic revolution of 1979. It's a big connection between the comfort, the, the material comfort of that decade and, and, and the event. And uh, I, I suspect, I argue with that uh, something similar happened in the 2000s. The other thing that happened is that, um, that that deal was not just a gift, it was not just a, a moment, a minute gift, and then people walked away. No, the, the, the British uh, diplomats and the, uh, and, the, and the Americans were actually constantly uh, negotiating what they wanted in terms of uh, a more liberal Again, this is a period where the US uh, foreign policy was absolutely dominated by this idea that liberal democracy had to be uh, spread all over the world. Uh, we're talking about, about what happened right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, and, and that pressure was very real. And, um, and Gaddafi had to liberalize his system. He had to liberalize it from an ideological perspective, allow some kind of political dissonance to exist in this country and also liberalize the economy. And in fact, you can try to guess which one terrorized him. Uh, 
what really scared them was the idea of having a new class of entrepreneurs and, and dynamic businessmen. He was more uh, afraid of, of liberalizing his economy than, than tolerating some kind of a, uh, of a pluralism uh, or pluralistic system politically. And that's the reason he started basically freeing and, and forgiving all the Islamist uh, opponents that he had in jail, that he had thrown in jail in the 80s and the 90s. And one actor who was actually really pushing him in that direction was Qatar. Qatar was already very, very active inside Libya during the 2000s. And, and people usually forget about this. It's hardly mentioned in the literature. Um, and so Qatar was basically in the name of, of mediating in the name of, of putting an Arab face to uh, the uh, Western diplomacy that was trying to liberalize the system, was always encouraging uh, the, the regime to um, you know, forgive and, and release a lot of the Islamist opponents that were rotting in jail. This, this uh, process basically uh, unfolded between 2005 and, and you know, on the eve, until the eve of, of the revolution. And that explains why there was a business, uh, a position that was basically free when, uh, when 2010, 2011, uh, 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 occurred. Uh, so basically, so we're here in, in February, mid-February, you have a series of very authentic, very genuine, organic uh, eruption of, of anger on the part of the public. It happened in several cities. Uh, it, you know, the literature tends to talk about Benghazi a lot, but the same uh, episodes and, and spontaneous uh, revolts have occurred roughly the same time. I'm talking about mid February 2011 in these cities on the coast, Zaria to the west of Tripoli, Tripoli itself. Some of the cities here in the uh, Western Mountains, you have basically the Chino Mountains here. Um, and, uh, and this, there's no real analysis of why that happened. Uh, the, the first few books that started being released on that topic really basically came out this year. And I think a lot more has to be written. For example, the link with the economic and social uh, parameters of, that characterize the living conditions at that point. So um, <clears throat> when, when that happened, uh, the West effectively within a few days decided that war was going to be waged against the, the British. And that decision hadn't been made in, in any, other, any other country. And, and I would like here to take a few minutes to, uh, to try and, and tell you why. Um, the uh, one, one typical theory is that um, Gaddafi was being extremely uh, you know, threatening, potentially very dangerous, and it's going to kill thousands of, of demonstrators. And that's the official reason that was basically invoked. And uh, part of it, a big part of it is true, that he, he, he was going to he was going to kill people, for sure. But what I question is that is whether it was the actual reason that motivated uh, countries like uh, France, uh, Britain, and, and of course, the uh, the Arab states and, uh, and America. Uh, here, effectively, there are three or four different reasons that emerged, and, and, and basically everybody on the same page within just a few days. The first thing that you have to keep in mind is that um, the worst, the most dramatic, I should say, the most dramatic uh, Arab uprising event had already occurred by mid-February. The departure of Hosni Mubarak from Cairo. Hosni Mubarak had been in power in Egypt uh, since 1981. And uh, Egypt is much more important than Libya, simply owing to demographic reasons. It's, uh, right now it's more than 100 million at the time, of 90 or 88 million. Um, and that basically happened because the US president uh, at the time had uh -huh. So here you find the idea that it is, by default, a good idea to spread liberal democracy everywhere in the world, including in the Middle East. Uh, so Barack Obama thought that it was a good idea to not try to save President Obama, 
about on the administration's initiative. Um, there was no war, there was no intervention. That decision actually created a big fear among the Gulf states. And uh, the Gulf states were paradoxically very much interested in actually overthrowing Gaddafi. Because Mubarak was seen as a useful, good dictator, and Gaddafi was an annoying one that the first time to be a good one. So that distinction is absolutely key from a, an Arab perspective. That's how the Saudis were thinking, and that's how the Emiratis were thinking. And of course, Qatar wanted the revolutionary. Um, and so, in a strange moment of, of agreement, we basically had an alignment between all those uh, Arab states that I just mentioned. Not all of them in general, of course, Syria was against it, Algeria was against it, but those three uh, in the Gulf were interested in, in creating a war in, in Libya. First of all, because they didn't like Gaddafi, he was uh, always uh, disrespectful, creating problems, questioning their authority, and so on. And so forth. But more importantly, there was a crisis in Bahrain. Bahrain is effectively much closer to Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. So the idea was to say we are going to effectively create a war over there, uh, absorb all the attention on cable TV uh, in order to be able to suppress the demonstrations in a uh, territory that is much more strategic and much more crucial in that respect. And of course, you know, um, the West followed for different reasons. Hillary was deeply interested in having a war as part of her plans to uh, run for president. France thought that it was just an easy job, a great opportunity to jump at this, there was always a desire for the French to uh, somehow have a government in Tripoli with this very prestigious, rich, as you said, country uh, called Libya, had finally a government in Tripoli that would be uh, friendly to, to, to France. So all those states basically agreed and conducted war. And the war basically started roughly one month after the beginning of the uprisings. Uh, for one month, the population of Libya was growing. And from a historical perspective, it's very interesting to kind of know that you have this interval of time that you can study. Because for one month, they had no reason to think that somebody was going to come to their rescue. And they still revolted. They still took incredible risks. And, and, and you know, sometimes that month long period is forgotten. People feel that there was some kind of conspiracy. They were revolting in Saudi Arabia because they knew that some, you know, some class was going to be called later or was going to come and save them. That's not uh, exactly how, how it turned out. Um, and one very important um, thing that I would like to say about the rebellion is that the rebellion split almost immediately. So you have effectively a rebellion that looked unified at the beginning, the first few weeks. But within a couple of months, had a very classical division within the world, among the rebels. And if you if you study revolutions uh, through history, you will always find the same kind of split. You have those that would like to change, but just a little bit, and some others would like to change everything. Right? So you have the hardcore revolutionary rebels, and then you have the more prudent, more conservative rebels. So I'm just describing here a split that actually became visible within the rebellion. So you have the rebellion waging war against the loyalists that wanted to preserve the regime. And as they understood that they were probably going to win, and that happened very early, they started going after each other. And the disagreement was, how much of the old system do you preserve or do you just throw everything away and, and build a brand new uh, social order? Uh, and that is effectively the civil war that is still ongoing in many regards. Of course, things have changed. There were a lot of transformations and, uh, and, and a lot of nuances changed. But that disagreement that, happened, that occurred, that basically uh, became very visible in May 2011, has still been ongoing. So 
So what I'm saying is that the whole period, almost a decade now, has been one long continuous uh, conflict among Libyans. Uh, do you just uh, do you take the risk of distributing uh, privileges and, and, and prestigious positions to uh, layers of society that had nothing under Gaddafi? Do you accept that, or do you effectively end up? Uh, protecting the same pyramid, the same hierarchies as under the dictatorship, you just basically uh, decapitate and, and put the new head on top that you preserve the, the, same, the same system. Uh, and the coalition that the world unified, I'm talking about the international ones, is very often uh, commentary calls it a NATO intervention. It's, it wasn't a NATO intervention because you had countries that play the military role as part of that intervention that were not part of NATO. You had uh, you know, countries like Sweden and, you know, and Denmark and that were not necessarily part of NATO. But more importantly, you had three Arab states that intervened militarily. So when you say NATO intervention, everybody knows that that intervention was conducted from the sky. So the vast majority of it was basically just as so when you call it NATO intervention, you uh, you basically uh, lie to yourself because a lot of uh, the intervention actually happened on the ground on a clandestine basis. And that clandestine component was taken care of by the Arab states. One particular state by the name of Qatar distributed tens of thousands of tons of weapons. So it has nothing to do with abstracts and it has nothing to do with NATO. And, and of course, it was completely clandestine and invisible at the time. I spent years, not months, years to be able to tell exactly how it happened and what happened. And the Western states were not happy that there wasn't a conspiracy. There was no, um, uh, it wasn't, you know, oh, we have this Arab state in the Gulf that obeys the big masters and Western capitals. And it's all going to fit together. That's not at all what happened. Qatar was actually pushing for their own uh, agenda. And uh, uh, this phenomenon is, that I'm trying to highlight here is super interesting because the, it's really the disease that has been continuing to, uh, that has been eating away at it ever since. It's this idea that the, the reason the Western states didn't stop Qatar, although they disagreed with what was being done, is because they were looking to outsource this part of the cold uh, And the reason all Western states were so deeply interested in outsourcing the war is because of one trauma that had happened in 2003, Iraq. Iraq was the last conventional war where you end up sending 180,000 troops and, uh, and you know, wage war and you know, emerge as a victor and then that's not how it happened. It turned out to be a disaster on all fronts, economically, socially, psychologically, uh, from an oil perspective, from a strategic perspective, it was an absolute disaster. Vietnam looks good compared to, uh, to America. Um, and that's the reason now we effectively live in a period where no Western state is actually genuinely interested in actually conducting a conventional war. That's how you end up with this hope, this habitual hope of being able to outsource the war. So you're involved, but you're involved only you know, through airstrikes because you don't really want to touch the, the society that you're trying to interfere in. And, and, one did, and, and of course, you cannot outsource it because if you trust another state with what you believe is your conflict and your agenda, that state is never going to do exactly what you're they have their own agenda, their own perception, and their own priorities, and they end up doing something different. That notion of outsourcing a war is simply a myth. It's just completely reality. Yeah. Uh, and to this day, 2020, all the Western states continue thinking uh, with this hope, this constant hope of being able to get into a crisis and work with some other state that will not touch the crisis, and then hopefully, magically, that state will do exactly what we want. But it's really one of the most important uh, diseases that, I would, that affected, affected the history of uh, the recent history of, of Libya. 
So once once you accept that, once you accept, once you have this uh, goal state distributing you know, so much weather, and on top of it, there's another decision that I'd like to mention that was made right at the end of the NATO intervention, which is September or October 2011. Remember that money that I was mentioning, the 110 billion dollars sitting in the central bank? I'm talking about hard currency. I'm talking about dollars here, not not the numbers. Uh, it was basically unfrozen. It was frozen in February 2011. By October, November, it was unfrozen. So when NATO left, you had basically two tsunamis that had on spoon on the day. One tsunami of weapons. And of course, a tsunami of dollars. Uh, and that's, in a nutshell, uh, one of the reasons, uh, you know, the, the after, the, the you know, the, the couple of years after 2011, turned out to be a uh, uh, you know, beginning of, of, uh, of continual conflict that just uh, got worse and worse. Um, <clears throat> in terms of um, in terms of the state, you know, a lot of people talk about the state that Muammar Gaddafi had built as 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 being particularly weak, and I don't think it's a very useful concept. This this idea of weakness. It was idiosyncratic. It had institutions that were not impersonal or transparent or robust. Obviously, it was just a system that was very uh, twisted, and the reason it was twisted is because it was designed to collapse at the minute his, the, the creator of that system was going to get into trouble. That's basically the spirit with which he uh, built that thing. Um, so don't think that it was necessarily weak during the 42 years of, of him being in power. But of course, when it collapsed, there was nothing left in terms of dependable institutions or, or um, um, institutional memory, or, or the ability to trust uh, impersonal uh, organs like the police, or the education system, and so on, particularly in, in the realm of security. Um, so that means that this vast country could not be controlled controlled. This, so I, I was talking the other day to someone who was the head of intelligence uh, after 2011, I'm not going to say exactly to not uh, repeat him. But he basically told me a story of him actually grabbing a, a plane to go visit Benghazi. And he was uh, greeted by uh, foreigners. He wasn't even aware that people waiting for him on the tarmac were not even living. So to give you an idea of how chaotic and, and, uh, this, this, this uh, supposed order of 2011 was, uh, one important moment happened uh, in 2013, where the radical, remember the radical revolutionary, or call it maybe the hardline revolutionaries among the rebels, they continued. For them, the revolution should always be continued. You know, God's work is never done, right? You continue uh, questioning society, continue uh, you know, cleansing it, and removing all traces from the past. And that process actually continued. Uh, uh, after 2011, one key moment was May 2013, where a law uh, was passed by the government at the time. It was actually not really passed because the, the vote was continuous, it was actually forced by the federal government. Um, the, uh, the law actually um, prevented anybody who was somehow associated with the regime during those 32 years, uh, anybody who was associated with the regime was not allowed to occupy uh, a public uh, position. So all of a sudden now we have, by law, this, um, this decision to not be able to take advantage of all the democratic uh, competence that the country had in the name of the you know, this perpetual revolution. You had to continue revolution and get rid of anybody who was associated with the past, so you had up with the competence. That's what it comes down to. And the other consequence that it had was to create more solidarity between the prudent, conservative rebels that I was telling you about 
and of course the old regime. Uh, they were on opposite sides of the conflict in 2011, but after a law like the May 2013 uh, political, isolation, political isolation law, you kind of forced them to go back into the city camp and you create a bigger um, coalition, if you will, of people deeply now interested in fighting the hardcore revolutionaries. And that's the beginning of, uh, of what I call, of many people call the Second Civil War, which effectively began in mid-May mid -May 2014. What did I forget? May 2013, May 2014, something else happened, and, you know, in the, in the middle. It's effectively what happened in Egypt. Don't forget, Egypt is always vastly, incomparably more important than Libya. It's just bigger. You know, and by the way, the reason I didn't mention the foreign states during that period is because everybody is, is occupied, preoccupied with Egypt. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I, wanted, that I was um, telling you about earlier is the attitude of the Arab states. The Arab states were horrified at the fact that President Barack Obama allowed um, the autocratic president of Egypt, Hosni Mubarak, at the time, to be told in January 2011. But still, they went to war in, in Libya. So the reason they went to war in Libya was not to spread democracy. So the Western states, when they went into Libya in 2011, for them it was obvious that the goal was to spread their own democracy. But the Arab states, they were helping them. They were part of the same military uh, coalition, had exactly the opposite idea. And they were still part of the world protect presented as being part of the same big hand family. So that tells you how this misfortune this movement, this object that intervened in Libya was, it was already um, completely divided and with no particular uh, consistent agenda. And that is really to continue, obviously, to continue growing after this. Especially when you see um, what happened with, with Egypt. Egypt had now, a president in 2012, 2013, they had the president that was part of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood wants reform. It's a religionist current, wants change. Um, and that is absolutely, obviously, unacceptable from a Gulf state perspective. If you're the Emirates or if you're Saudi Arabia, you do not want change. Because for you, change is like a disease, it's like coronavirus you know, spreading uh, across the Arab world, and it's going to hit, you know, reach, reach the Arabian Peninsula at some stage and the double. So, this idea of a change or refusal of any change is absolutely key. So, it's the reason the Muslim Brotherhood is hated by Arab regimes has nothing to do with religion, absolutely nothing to do with religion. It's not the fact that those people are conservative or want to institute Sharia law or are more pious than the next guy. It's the fact that they want to use the religious argument to offer change in society. Right? So there are a lot of very intransigent, very conservative religious movements or phenomena that exist in the Arab world that do not want change in society. And the Arab regimes love them. So you see that both are religious, and both use religion as part of a political argument. One uses it for change, and that's absolutely uh, scary for uh, Saudi Arabia or the Emirates. And of course, those same uh, regimes don't have a problem with religion if it's used in the name of actually preserving society as is and concentrating power and always obeying the state. So you always think about the relationship with the existing social uh, social order and the relationship with the existing state. If you're in the business of, of, of changing things, of being a revisionist, then you're going to meet a lot of resistance. If you want everything to stay static, and if you just want to obey, you can be as conservative religiously as you want. You can talk about Sharia law all day long. The Arab regimes are not, are not going to have a problem. They're going to love it, actually. They're going to support you. So don't ever think that the problem with this is about the religion. It's how this religion is being used as an argument for change. It's the fact that it's a 
versions of the current. So, uh, to finish this, uh, this chapter about, about uh, Egypt, the president uh, that was part of the Muslim Muhammad Morsi, had to go, right? And um, the Western states were now uh, behaving differently. In 2013, they were much less enthusiastic about this idea of, of, of uh, promoting change in the Arab world than in 2011. It's like a hangover, right? They were much less euphoric, much less optimistic, and, and, uh, and much more open to the idea of restoring very anti-liberal systems. A dictatorship is a very anti-liberal thing. So, liberal democracy or liberal democratic idealism in 2011, by the time President Obama starts his second term, he's already very different, different guy. Much less committed to uh, liberal democracy. You could discuss why, you could write two books on this, but the bottom line is that he changed, and France had changed, and the UK had changed, and all Western states had changed. Much less important. Which means, effectively, that the Arab states, particularly the UAE, and Saudi Arabia, when they worked with big parts of Egyptian society to restore dictatorship in uh, Egypt, the Western states were okay with it. They actually had That is just a two-year period, 2011 to 2013. So after Ju July 2013, uh, a lot of the Libyan actors inside Libya that really had all kinds of reasons to hate the revolution knew what to do to try and find support. You just have to do, you know, it's like Harry, uh, when Harry and Sally, you know, whatever she had. Exactly, basically they borrowed exactly the narrative of, of uh, this Egyptian marshal in March, CC, who would become president in 2014. And what is the signature of this narrative? It's basically to demonize change. Anything that resembles change is horrible. And his trick is to say that any moderate proponent of political Islam is effectively an extremist. If you're a moderate, you're just an extremist, which is absurd, mathematically. Right? So basically, the, the idea of being a moderate is impossible. You're just hiding it. You're just hiding your true self. And you're waiting for the, the first opportunity to uh, resort to terrorism. So you cannot be a moderate religionist force in politics. You cannot legitimately ask for change. And that's the trick in the Egyptian narrative. And that's obviously immediately used by um, the, the coalition, the armed coalition, here we're talking about the military object, that is being put together in Benghazi by this. Um, uh, former Gaddafi general by the name of Marshal Hafta. And he, he basically spent 20 years in the, in the United States and he understood how foreign states worked. And the other thing that's very important that he understood was that, you know, if you're helped by foreign states, you can make all kinds of mistakes. You know, uh, the help coming from outside is infinite. So, you don't have to have the best strategy, you don't have to be uh, at the head of uh, the most perfect army. Just focus on your narrative, make sure that it's seductive, come up with roughly the right ideas, and if you stumble, somebody will come to your rescue. Because foreign states are infinitely richer and bigger and more powerful than whatever you do in that little country. Nobody cares about it a bit. So this, this, um, idea was, uh, was key, and he began with a rather legitimate war. Uh, he did it his, in his own way, and I think the way he did it was particularly politicized and dangerous, but in Benghazi, you had uh, very radical, not to say extremist groups uh, that were uh, completely ignoring the state and, and creating a dynamic that was out of control. And one thing he could have done, Marshal Hatawi, in his war in May 2014, was to say, 
I'm just performing a counterterrorism kind of service. I'm going to stay away from politics. I'm just going to follow the most optimal behavior that I can possibly come up with in order to reduce the security threat. That's not at all what he did. He actually focused on the narrative, made it as a seductive for the foreign states, and if it meant a much longer war involving a larger, a larger enemy, then so be it. What matters is the narrative, and what matters is that I'm supported as long as possible by foreign states because I have a political agenda. Why do I say that the enemy is larger and larger? It's because what he did effectively was exactly what the Egyptian, uh, his Egyptian colleague, was ignore the notion or actually rule out the notion of being moderate. So if you're extremist and you're more reasonable, I call you both both of you extremists. So if I end up treating you bad, at some stage you're going to say, you know what, screw this, and you're going to join the extremist. Right? If I cannot distinguish moderate from extremist, I'm going to end up with a lot of extreme adversaries. That's not very smart, is it? Well, it is smart. If your objective is to attract as much uh, support from the outside world, it is the right thing to do. You're going to end up waging a much longer war. You're going to destroy more people, destroy more buildings. It's going to be a long detour, but that's still better if your goal is, is political and not, not really about uh, reducing the security threat. It's not really about conventional security. You basically live in a political, political uh, universe. Um, and that war, effectively, this, I should say, this military campaign that started in Benghazi, first of all, uh, required 39 months of war just to pacify, as they say, the city of, of Benghazi. The city of Benghazi has roughly 800,000 um, population, and, um, and, as, you know, and, and it, the, the, this coalition that, that Haftar was able to put together at the beginning, he had only 200 men, and very quickly the proof of concept turned out to be convincing. And instead of just having Egypt and Saudi Arabia helping him just a little bit, what happened during 2014, the second half of 2014, is that the Emirates uh, that had a key role in Egypt decided to uh, to ban him. And that meant much more money, much more weapons, and more importantly, it meant that now all of a sudden he benefited from their diplomatic umbrella, their ideological coverage. Because when you're when you're protected or defended or promoted by the Emirates, the Emirates have one big strength, is that that soft power outreach and diplomacy in Western countries is just absolutely excellent. It's probably the best you can possibly imagine in terms of, 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 of being effective. So what this means is that how far started being seen as a very positive actor, despite his refusal to distinguish the moment from, from the hardliners and so on and so forth. And uh, he was presented as a pure counterterrorism actor, when obviously uh, he was using counterterrorism as a vehicle to basically achieve his political ambitions. Uh, and, and as a result, in capitals like Paris, you have a different Hafta. You have like the mythical version of Hafta, always presented in very positive ways. You cannot criticize him, you know, the glowing portraits in the, in the press, vanity for articles uh, as early as 2014 and so on and so forth. And, um, and all of this was way before uh, my problem. I'm going to start a little bit faster. 2015, the war that had erupted in Benghazi and also in Tripoli in 2014 started cooling off. There was a will, there was a desire on the part of the top enemy of Hafta, Misranta, that views itself. Misranta is a very rich, very populous, very dynamic, commercially speaking, merchant city. It's a port city, 350,000 uh, inhabitants with a uh, long tradition uh, as, uh, as as traders, uh, you know, a free trade zone, uh, very active ports, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, 
uh, culture completely oriented towards uh, uh, economic initiative and, and so on and so forth. And of course, those people want to continue the revolution. So we have here a bastion of the revolution in Israel, and here uh, this military campaign that had been initiated by Marfa Hafta, who finds himself as a counter uh, counter terrorism and counter revolutionary. Of course, the uh, top enemies of Haftar here locally speaking in Benghazi, as I said, a lot of the war that he waged was less than that. There were extremists, there were radicals. And you see here the distance, the geographic distance, meant that Misraq, uh, supported already by, uh, by Turkey, at the time, but not just Qatar, but also Turkey, was happy to send logistical equipment, weapons, to whoever was resisting Haftar. If the person had a legitimate grievance, then fine. If they did it, if they were extremes, this is fine also. Everybody, everybody that fought Haftar was going to receive during that period help from Israel. But when it comes to direct uh, competition, there was a desire to pull things off. So we entered the period that saw the emergence of uh, the current government of National Corps. The government of National Corps uh, was installed in Tripoli in March 2016. And um, the, mo the most, um, the most uh, virulent supporters or promoters were the United States, Britain, Italy, uh, Algeria, and not really France, not really Egypt, not really the conservative Arab, Arab regimes. But they tolerated it. They were not totally opposed. So the government that is currently in place in Turkey today, in 2020, was in fact uh, installed more than four years ago by the Barack Obama administration, by pre-Brexit uh, Britain, by pre saudi Italy. Those were uh, more active, diplomatically speaking, more active states, uh, more um, committed to whatever is the equivalent of democracy. And here I'd like to introduce this idea of pluralism. Pluralism is, is what resembles democracy in a, in a very fractured state. Do you want just one actor that has supremacy, or do you try to put multiple actors that only really get along with each other? And find an arrangement so that they can coexist without killing each other, that's pluralism. And, and if you hate democracy because you happen to be a dictatorship, you are also going to hate pluralism. Because pluralism is the beginning of it. something that could look like, uh, that could look like democracy. It's, you have multiple branches there you have to talk to, the negotiations are more difficult, and more importantly, uh, you have much more political uncertainty. And those things are to the existential threat when uh, you view yourself as a, a very vertical uh, system of uh, authoritarian system. Um, <clears throat> but hey, wait a second. Why is Turkey uh, supporting this thing? Because Turkey, every time you hear about Turkey in the media, you hear about the authoritarian drive of, uh, of Erdogan. Turkey, you don't want to be, uh, you know, arrested in Turkey. Right? You don't want to be uh, a journalist that criticizes the state in Turkey. Obviously, everybody has heard of the authoritarian characteristic, growing, you know, increasingly authoritarian characteristic of Turkey. But how come Turkey is on the side of these guys? Well, just you know, I don't want. I just for you to be able to use it as a starting point. Turkey is too pluralist, too democratic from the point of view of Arab states. The Arab, the Arab conservative Arab regimes like Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Emirates are much more vertical. There's no true parliament. You do not have political parties that disagree with each other with different currents and changes of alliances and this kind of and Erdogan does. I mean of course he wants less and less of it. Uh, as, as time goes by, but he is a product of revolutionism. He's not a traditional vertical dictator. He's more of, of the revolution, the revolutionary kind. So 
here you basically have a clash between two styles of authoritarianism. Uh, and that, those small differences, of course, look ridiculous if you live in Denmark, right? But if you live in this region, it means you know, a huge universe, a huge distance between those two models, and they will go uh, against each other. Um, so the government of national war is installed in the spring of 2016. Um, Russia starts really playing a role. Of course, it has a historical alliance with Egypt. It hates democracy. It's liberalism. So the first alliance that it thinks about the most natural one is to be on the side of Haftar here. Um, so the influence of Russia um, starts getting felt in, in 2016. But wait a second, before Russia shows up, and by the way, all the foreign states that are interfering um, on both sides of the main fault line in Libya are all US. All the states that I've mentioned since, since the beginning are all supposed to be friendly. Right? They're all part of the US law that tells you how dysfunctional uh, the US led uh, system has become. So when Russia gets into Libya, it knows it goes into a very dysfunctional deal. And it's going to try and take advantage of the existing tendencies that. Uh, useful to itself. Um, <clears throat> the war becomes a little bit cooler, less violent, you know, with, with horrible incidents and clashes and, and slippages. But the whole period between 2015 and 2019, so I'm already at this very key moment, April 2019, that I was telling you about the beginning, when how far. You know, he's no longer busy with Baghdad. He goes into the south and then attacks uh, Tripoli from both the south and northern and from the east. During that whole period of four years, the situation was not horrible. It was not hopeless in Libya in terms of the number of deaths per day, in terms of, of contacts. The, the, the conservative Arab regimes that I have been telling you about since the beginning were actually in contact with some of the militias in Tripoli. Um, the Islamist militias were less and less powerful. The more centrist, more agnostic militias that are more interested in just business and pragmatism were more and more powerful. They were in dialogue with the anti-Islamist states. So things were kind of converging in a, in a direction that should really satisfy uh, the conservative Arab regimes, mainly the United Arab Emirates. It was a slow process, but nonetheless, it was still going in the direction that we, the Emirates, should appreciate. But uh, when you're 76, you tend to be in hurry, right? And Marshal Haftar, on whom all you know, all the chips had been back. You know, everything had, you know, he was at the top of his armed coalition. Uh, again, we, we end up with the same vertical system, very hierarchical. He was in a position to make a very whimsical, very precious decision. He just decided to go to war. He was sick of waiting, quote unquote, that's a book. He was just impatient, you know, he was sick and tired of waiting. And Instead of finding these sophisticated arrangements with slow convergence and try to find them, what he did basically was uh, conduct a frontal attack. And his armed coalition was not quite ready. Was it big enough? It wasn't big enough. Was it powerful enough and disciplined enough? No, it wasn't. And what is the population here? You know, this little territory here uh, concentrates. 45% of the population of Libya uh, in the, the greater Tripoli area. Uh, just Tripoli itself is 1.2 million. So he has basically, uh, among his army, roughly 5,000, 6,000 uh, fighters that are willing to go 600 miles or 800 miles away from home and fight in Tripoli and attack this huge area. 
Why did he do that? Because he knew that the minute he was going to stumble, and boy, did he stumble, foreign states were going to come up, you know, come out of the woods and save him. That's exactly what happened within days. Within days of the attack, armed drones conducted or you know, operated by the Emirates started uh, carrying out uh, airstrikes in, uh, in the Tripoli area. If you look at the period between April and December 2019, the Emirates conducted 1,000 airstrikes, the majority of, of which were conducted using armed drones, the rest with uh, French-made um, um, fighter jets. And the reason I'm mentioning these is because imagine any state conducting 1,000 airstrikes, let's say, on Copenhagen, since I mentioned them, or here. We would call it a military intervention, at least, right? You would call it a progression, probably. But let's say you use your euphemism, you would call it a military intervention. You would never see in the press the action conducted by the Emirates, described as a uh, military intervention in the Tripoli area in 2019. Uh, that's interesting. The reason is because of the deep friendship that the Emirates has in all Western countries, especially in Paris and, and of course in Russia. And uh, within less than two months, Turkey responded in kind. Turkey sent its own armed drones and helped the government of Tripoli uh, resist the, uh, the offensive led by Marshal Haftar and supported by the armed drones of the Emirates. And that war doesn't produce any winner. It's very destructive, but nothing clear comes out of it. And, um, and the motivation on the Haftar side starts fading away. And in August 2019, he goes through a dangerous moment, and to avoid a collapse that was about to happen, eventually, uh, Russian mercenaries are sent uh, into the outskirts of Germany. So the Russian mercenaries were already helping in here in the East, and the East is not very transparent, nobody kind of really knew about them, but they had been there for, for roughly three years. But now, you have Russian mercenaries helping a rebel or renegade general, or at least a non-state actor, attack a major North African capital, just 600 kilometers away from the EU. And, um, and that started happening in September 2019. Um, the reason I mention the Russian mercenaries is because it's not really a strategic decision made by the Russian state. It's more just a tool that's used by the Kremlin. Move them up, here's the help and see what happens. It's not a strategic decision that was made by Vladimir Putin to do whatever the Russian state can do in order to make sure that Haftar comes out and win. That's not what happened. It's much more optimistic, much more hungry than this. And, uh, and that's how we get to November 2019 when Turkey, who had conducted roughly 300 airstrikes up to that point, uh, says to the GMA, you look like you're not going to survive. You know, maybe you should get some help. Without help, things are not looking too good for you. And the GMA said, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? You know, like, you're talking about me? Yeah, I'm talking about you. You see that you're not going to survive. Nobody big really helps you. And uh, of course, what Turkey was driving at was a quick pop -up. promised real military intervention in support of the GNA if the GNA accepted signing a maritime accord that Turkey really wanted, that was really designed for the best interests of Turkey, not, not particularly for the best interests of, of the Libyan government. But the Libyan government of Germany signed because it was obviously deeply interested in surviving. It was really a matter of surviving. And that is the deal or the dual deal that was signed on the 27th of November 2019. So it's a strange moment, right? Because Turkey announces to the world that it, it is going to intervene overtly in Libya. All the other military interventions that I have mentioned so far were completely clandestine. 
Find them some. So if you ask the state responsible for them, they say, I don't know what to tell you. All the money. But Turkey was very transparent, very brazen, completely illegal, by the way, as illegal as every other intervention. But it was done in the abroad space. And it started implementing exactly what it had announced. And uh, it's strange because if you, if you look at the press in January, February, March of this year, there's no recognition that Turkey is really intervening in Libya. They really didn't make it a secret. They announced it as early as possible. But the Western states still had this idea that Turkey was just this Islamic country with no real industry, no real army, no real technology, no high technology, obviously. Right? So it was in denial. If you study the press, the perception in the West was that nothing really serious was happening in the world. And then when, uh, when everything turned out to be very uh, compelling and very uh, effective from a technical perspective, I'm not defending Turkey in terms of its agenda, its politics, but from a technical perspective, the armed drones of Turkey did the fantastic job. The air defense systems, the electronic warfare, the software component of the, of the drone, all of that worked beautifully. Of course, the other thing that Turkey did was send uh, roughly 7,000 or 8,000 Syrian mercenaries from that other country, from the Um But what really made a difference was the technology. technological aspect, not so much the manpower that was not really needed. Uh, the bottom line is that the uh, the offensive that was still ongoing, so we are now in May, 13th, 13th month, June, 14th month of this offensive that Haftar really should not have started, uh, ends up being crushed by, uh, by Turkey. So you could ask me, what happened to the Russian mercenaries? Well, the Russian mercenaries actually were withdrawn by decision. Uh, resulting from a dialogue between Anka and Moscow. Um, so here I could talk to you about for, for an hour about what was going on there. But it's interesting to see Russia playing such a destructive, such a lethal role, and still not convinced that Haftar is pursuing a, a smart strategy. It's not even convinced that the Emirates, who is number one supporter, is actually pursuing a very smart agenda. The agenda in Russia is different, and it uses the Russian mercenaries as just a tool to stay there, to build leverage, to become more and more vital, to be able to make sure that the Kremlin's opinion matters more and more. But it's not because they believe in the military action, because they have a different agenda. And the other thing that happened in, at the same time as the withdrawal. The Russian mercenaries, instead of just leaving the country, a lot of people thought they were leaving the country, they were not leaving the country at all. They were actually even moving away from the function of helping the offensive, assisting the offensive, into a more defensive role, with, of course, more political say on how things should be done. And this is where we stand right now. The, the Russian mercenaries are in the city of Surt, in the east, they're not in the city itself, not anymore. They planted hundreds, not to say thousands, of anti personnel mines to basically turn that city into a real trap. They installed air defense systems. They uh, dug some trenches to make the access to that city more and more difficult. They made sure that the military power that Turkey was able to cobble together in the West was not going to be able to take so. What's so special about so? Nothing. I said nothing. There's nothing special about Serbia. What's special is the orders here. And this area that you see is capable of exporting, if you look at all the ports and the terminals, is uh, able to export more than 600,000 barrels of crude oil per day. So, to prevent the Tripoli government from taking that super strategic area, a lot of the work was not done by Egypt, it was done by the Russian mercenaries, receiving very, very close, not to say intimate help from the Emirates. Uh, it was not even done by the Libyans, 
Something similar was done here in the Jufra Air Base. Think of it uh, geographically. If you possess this uh, air base, you can project power into CERT, but you could also project power in the southwest. So that's the status quo that we're standing on uh, at this minute. And uh, hopefully, uh, I'll have given you a uh, desire to read more to um, get an appreciation of how uh, anarchic the area that is just a few hundred kilometers away from the EU has become, and how complicit uh, the Western states. For example, it's one thing that I should have mentioned more and then finish with this. France is the deepest, the more committed, most committed, more and most dependable uh, ideological diplomatic political school that we have So it's on the side of the Russian nurseries, on the side of the more authoritarian uh, uh, camp, if you will, because it is against political Islam, it's against change, and it uh, has to do something. Very comprehensive overview. Um, it was quite a lot more than I expected in terms of uh, new knowledge and new learning for me as well, even though I've been following this conflict for years. Um, and uh, now we'll move into a short QA portion. Um, usually I would go out into the crowd and hand out the microphone for you to uh, ask your own questions. Uh, but today I'm going to do uh, what they usually don't ask you to during lectures, which is to take out your phones, um, because we're going to be asking questions through an online platform called onlinequestions.org. So please, uh, if you can just go to this URL, um, and then you have an event number right here, 20201, enter that, and then you can ask your questions. Um, make a new question, sort it out by votes, and uh, we'll, I will see what uh, pops up. If you don't want to write your own question, then just upvote, start someone else's, and we'll see what questions are most want to be answered. Uh, so while you're doing that, I'll just ask a question of my own as well. Onlinequestions.org 20201. Uh, so, while you're doing that, I would just ask a question of my own, which is uh, about the international aspect of the Libyan conflict. So, not only have international actors essentially decided the cause of the war thus far, in terms of Turkey supporting the GNA and um, the coalition supporting the House of Representatives, but the conflict has also expanded into the wider Mediterranean region and competition over uh, into Syria and into other domains of conflict not only uh, security-related, but also political. Um, so what I'm wondering as well is how this plays into the relations between France, Turkey, Egypt, and other uh, international actors in the game. Um, well, see, what, what happened with uh, in Turkey is pretty scary, because now Turkey is really uh, routinely described as a, a mortal enemy. This wasn't the case a couple of years ago. So you could say in some way that France has uh, found a brand new enemy in, in this already worrisome world stage. And um, in Europe, you have two schools of thought. You have the one led by Germany and Italy and, and Britain and all these people. I think that it could be avoided. Um, France doesn't have to necessarily describe Turkey as a rogue state that is just dangerous and filled with evil intentions and committed to committing crimes in 35 minutes. Um, and then you have another school of thought, obviously the one led by France and uh, populated with countries like uh, Greece and Cyprus and, and others. I think um, there is, uh, for example, here in the Netherlands, that I, I feel great sympathy for the French. In all cases, the split between the EU is, is, uh, is going to evolve 
I think that uh, this was very lengthy, but when you're just when you're less than two years away from the presidential elections, and uh, as a and as an incumbent president, you can speak about this horrible, very cold enemy that happens to be supporting political Islam, and you know, of course, that political Islam exists within French society. If you can demonize it, then you know you're effectively, even if you're not part of that. You're utilizing an old trick that is usually exploited by the far right. And that domestic dimension, unfortunately, I think I could argue or could demonstrate that Macron uh, is has actually attracted uh, to the idea of using those tricks, those old ugly tricks. So, so it didn't begin with Libya, and it's not going to end with Libya. Right now it's more in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, but Libya was really what meant. All right, thank you for the comprehensive answer to my question. Uh, very uh, good overview. Um, so now on to the very uh, first questions from the audience. Uh, the first question which people have answered is what is the current political situation is in the GMA? So, uh, That's a very good question. Um, See, um, the Turkish plan is a very ambitious plan. And that's a polite way of saying that it's really um, unrealistic. Uh, if, you, if you see all the, the various steps that Turkey has to still accomplish in order to be able to secure the, the maritime corridor that it wants between Turkey itself and, and, and Eastern Libya. East so, what this means is that the offensive that was threatening the very survival of Tripoli is gone, it was repelled, right? The military phase of whatever Turkey had to do is completed successfully. So now we have a sense of, of calm, and not peace, but quiet. There's no immediate threat to your survival. And, of course, Tripoli was extremely divided before the attack. April 2019. So what this means concretely is that you already have actors that tend to be very, 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 very pro-Turkey, anti-Russia, you know, looking to be more aggressive, trying to take more territory and, and, and employ a very uh, hardline rhetoric. And then you have other ones that are already like trying to hedge their bets and try to, to imagine Turkey failing. And how do you, as a Libyan actor, position yourself now? Turkey is in town, it's protecting your military, it saved your ass, to my French, just a few, a few months ago, and you're already trying to bet on it actually collapsing for um, due to international pressure or whatever else. Um, so you already have visions that come back to the fore because the offensive. So this is like the vicious consequences of, um, of, of this heightened sense of security that of course didn't exist in, uh, in May of this year. Um, so a lot of division, a lot of juggling, juggling and um, a lot of uh, willingness to position oneself so as to win the political bets that are living, living in nature and, and, uh, and try to, to imagine the future with other partners very active at just the stage. Great, thank you. And then uh, on to the next uh, question, uh, for the, which is uh, why does the GMA and how does the GMA hold this area of uh, Libya? Um, and it also, uh, just with this, Matt answered another question which is I have there, which is what is a good source to follow the conflict? This is a good source to follow the conflict because these are the current lines of uh, Conflict in Libya and how the situation is now since the June map, which you can see for the rest of the lecture. And so, Mr. Arshawi, why and how? Well, it's, you, you should not imagine that there's an army that is like controlling every single bit until the, the final tip here. It's like you have to imagine more like shades of grey 
Uh, third term that is held effectively is really around Tripoli and the strata here. And even like cities that are immediately to the west of, uh, of Tripoli, like Zawiya, you already have some uncertainty, some potential fault lines. So it's not neat, it's not tidy, uh, it's not complete control. Um, this is still a coalition that was responsible for a much smaller territory just six months ago. Does it have the institutional strength, the organizational skills to control that small piece here? Not yet. Um, so it's really a moving target. And uh, it's very difficult to keep track of what's going on, but uh, what you should keep in mind is that Turkey has already four bases. It has one naval base and three air bases that it can use for its uh, armed drones. Uh, this means that if someone has the, the, the idea to go and attack now, uh, they will have to, 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 be, to be, they will have to face the, the, uh, the Turkish force, in addition to the ground forces of, of Libyans and of course the Syrian mercenaries that are still around. Um, the question also specifically wanted to know about uh, this area in Libya, uh, down south, how exactly does the GNA or at least what it looks like on the map pulled that territory. Yeah, um, one thing that, uh, this is probably one of the most important things that you should know about coming life right now in, in Libya. One of the most, the first first and major decisions that uh, Haftar, along with uh, his foreign backers, made in January, in early January of this year, which is just a few weeks after they realized that Turkey was really serious about their own intervention, was to shut down the only economic activity capable of generating in this country, which is oil extraction and gas extraction. So everything has been shut down, especially when we talk about the oil. Um, the, Libya has been basically exporting almost zero barrels a day um, since uh, January, despite COVID, despite the drop in oil prices, despite time. Just because of this political desire to punish Tripoli, Tripoli, we welcome Turkey. So we are me, you know, the, the, the Hafta army or the Hafta coalition. We're going to make sure that oil production doesn't lose you because we do not want the money to go to into into Turkish pockets. Um, and and those fields here, uh, they have capacity. The combined, there are two two. One big one and a uh, small one. The two combined have the capacity to produce roughly 400,000 uh, 400, barrels a day, and none of it is working. And uh, over the last couple of weeks, there has been reports that uh, the Russian mercenaries are, in small numbers, playing a role in making sure that uh, the Tripoli government cannot take them over. So you have a lot of Libyan brigades working for Haftar, but also a few dozen uh, Wagner mercenaries. Wagner is the name of the, of the paramilitary group uh, that I keep referring to. So you have a Russian influence, which is quite shocking, right? because from a US perspective, this shouldn't happen. So that, that, is, that says a lot about the Trump administration. Trump is really characterized by a deep ambivalence when it comes to fighting with Russia. So the Pentagon has a doctrine to fight Russia. The Department of State has a doctrine to fight Russia. The White House, yeah. always a hesitation. They have this fighting. Why? Why should I fight Russia? All right. Um, due to time constraints, uh, we will only be asking two more questions. So I'll ask the current top question uh, in the website. And if you'd all like to just, again, uh, like we did in the last lecture, just Start the question which you want to answer most on this one. So the question is, uh, where is Saif El Qaddafi, and why did the Tobruk government release him? Um, well, first of all, he's he's not he's not really released. Uh, nobody knows exactly where he is, and uh, nobody even has a proof that he's alive. Um, one thing I would like to say is that. Very, very often when you see articles on Saif al-Islam, because he was basically the heir apparent when Muhammad al was alive. He was the son who was supposed to take over. Uh, 
So knowing that the sun which was supposed to replace him is still alive, then one simplistic way of looking at it is to say, well, if he's still alive, even if you don't have the proof of it, he's going to come out one day and he's going to run, he's going to win. And you see those articles on a regular basis in the Western press. That's not as simple. First of all, uh, greens, right, the green flags, and greens means that you're still loyal to the ideology of modern death. He's dead. He's been dead for nine years, but you're still loyal to what he represents. Those actors are very important. They're not the silent majority, right? they're not the majority. They're just an important part of society, an important uh, part of the political spectrum, but they're divided. And you could very well uh, witness a revival of Gaddafi's in Libya without Saif al Islam. Saif al Islam was actually despised by the true believers in Ram Gaddafi because he made you know, a tremendous series of mistakes in 2011 and even before that. So, Gaddafism was with in Poor. Right? So, you have different factions. Some are uh, very uh, distrustful of Haftar, others are in bed with him. Others are in bed with the GNA, others are still looking, so it's very divided. And maybe one day something will emerge and it will matter. They already matter, but they're divided. So it's much more complex than what you often see. All right, thank you. Um, now for the final question um, What is the humanitarian situation in Libya? Does humanitarian aid reach the population? Well, um, the humanitarian crisis is uh, twofold. We have whatever the non libyans have to go through because it's a land of, uh, of migration. You have a large number of non libyans in Libya. Most of them are sub-Saharan Africans. And the number is somewhere between 400,000 and 700,000. The vast majority of those actually are not in Egypt danger. But you have a block of, let's say, roughly 10% are scattered in detention centers. Some are actually called detention centers, in other words, we know where they are. Others do not even deserve that name because they're completely opaque and completely secret, and they are just factories of torture uh, and factory of exploitation. So that alone is a very acute humanitarian crisis, and of course, it's much worse now after uh, whatever the EU Particularly Italy did in 2017, which is to make sure that the flow is zero. Right? The flow right now, in terms of the number of arrivals, undocumented arrivals into Sicily, is much, much smaller than whatever it had, had been until the summer of 2017. So 2017 falls off a cliff, and that effectively means that the business model of smugglers and traffickers inside of it changed because now it's much more specialized in torture. Sexual exploitation and forced labor and so on and so forth. So that is a big crisis, and the EU is not a good guy in this. There's another one, which is the suffering of Libyans themselves, uh, and they do suffer. Um, so you have a lot of displaced, a lot of you know, hundreds of thousands of displaced, you know, people from the East that have to live in the West, people from the West now. After the 14th the 14 month offensive, you have a lot of people that have to flee. And, and cannot come back. Um, and uh, of course, you have now salaries that are not being paid, you have inflation, you have COVID. And, and, uh, so when you think about migrants, don't imagine that uh, Libyans are uh, living like in, 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 in this land. They, they also suffer a lot. So think of two humanitarian crises. Well, um, thank you for the lecture once again. Thank you for the Additionally, our, uh, our association also always gives our speakers a token of appreciation. I would hand it over now and give a handshake, but with social distancing. Um, okay, so uh, thank you, Mr. Vashawi. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the lecture. I hope all of you did as well, and all of you did too. Uh, now, just some uh, general updates and information points on what's coming up in the next few weeks. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what's upcoming? What's happening uh, at SID? So next week we have uh, much a long-awaited lecture organized by my predecessor Nina Um 
which is titled The Right to Die, a lecture on euthanasia by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rob Trompier, who had originally hoped to come around sometime uh, January and February last year, right after the coronavirus has hit. But now we have another opportunity to host Mr. Trompier, and so I hope you all be there uh, on the 7th. Before then, we also have our freshman dinner, so if you would like to get to know some new uh, members of the SIM, or get to know us as board, or as older members, we might also be there uh, as introduction parents uh, to introduce you to our association and what we're about, please just go to the website, sign up, and be there. Uh, and then after that, the, on the 14th, we have a more special event organized by uh, Andrea Sarah-Alson of our introduction committee, um, which is a lecture by the Estonian ambassador, um, Eddie Jets. And uh, she will be joining us to have a very interesting talk on digital governments and uh, well, the current situation in the Estonia and the world. Um, so thank you all for attending the lecture, and thank you again, Philan, for uh, giving the lecture, and I hope to see you again in the